secfans.com. We are in the thick of the bowl season action. Of course, we've seen a lot of bowls already play out, which is going to lead to some great discussion. This is our preview show for Alabama and Clemson, the national championship game in in Tampa. Um, we've got a lot to talk about because we want to touch on some of the games that have already happened, but we're not going to do the normal show where we kind of review the action individually and then get into the games coming up because there's really only one game left that matters that we haven't already previewed. So this is our preview show, but we are going to touch on a lot of the other stuff that's happened so far both in the conference, out of the conference. We're going to touch on all those. I want to say thanks to everybody so far in the bowl season. The, the interaction, the comments, the score predictions, it's been awesome. Uh, the, the channel is growing unbelievably well. We're getting tons of interaction on the, on the, uh, on the YouTube channel. So um, just, just want to say thanks to everybody for that. Um, if you don't want to listen to a lot of review stuff, uh, I don't know what to tell you because it's going to kind of be intermixed with all of what we're talking about today. So just hang with us. I think you'll like this format. Uh, it's something new. Uh, and uh, Clemson fans, we hope you're on board as well. Uh, don't worry. We're going to give your team a lot of love, uh, especially for, for a couple of guys who talk about the SEC all the time. Okay, so Husky. We're going to talk about Alabama Clemson, and I know we th we can't really talk about that game without having a lot of discussion around what we've seen so far, not just in the bowl season, but in the, in the season throughout, because we've said some things in some recent shows about how we thought the SEC, particularly the top of the SEC, was going to prove better than everybody was suspecting, especially the narrative we've heard all season of the SEC down, the SEC sucks. Um, but what I want to get your thoughts on are, so far in the bowl season, I feel like we've been fairly vindicated on the SEC looking really good. But did you see the ACC... Uh, be in the conference that they've been so far in terms of success on the field, or did they come out of nowhere a little bit for you uh, and surprise you with what you've seen? I really wasn't overly surprised, honestly. Uh, and it's easy to say that, right, uh, in hindsight. But I kind of thought they may be good. And, you know, there were some, you know, we made comments and, you know, other shows, other places that, probably a lot of people missed because our content kind of gets chopped up sometimes where I said, I felt like the ACC may be a little bit better. You know, I know we had some uh, offline conversations about it than people were given credit for. Um, and for those that don't, you know, follow our show or those that do a running theme for us, probably for about, I don't know what do you say, maybe seven weeks, last seven weeks of the season was this concept of a bag of wins, right? That the top teams in a lot of conferences were basically getting by by playing a lot of teams in their conference that weren't very good, which was guaranteeing wins. Uh, in other words, you know, we harped a lot on the Big Ten, and we've done this for weeks. We took a lot of crap from Big Ten fans in our comment sections. There's a couple rants we have posted on our YouTube channel um, where we talked about how there were nine teams in the Big Ten that had won one combined game against the other five. And then there were five teams at the bottom of the Big Ten that had not won any games against the teams in the top nine. And so Big Ten teams basically in a, you know, eight, nine game conference schedule, if you're in there or you're in the Pac-12, it was entirely possible that they were getting eight or nine wins, we felt like, basically baked into their schedule. And as much as they wanted to trumpet all the 10 win teams they had in their conferences, uh, our feeling was, well, they have 10 win teams because, you know, if you're a good team, and, and, and I'm not saying you're not a bad team, but if you're a good team, so you're a fair amount above average, that you almost were guaranteed nine wins. And if that's the case, then, you know, making 10 wins or 11 wins. Well, if you've got five teams that all have eight wins guaranteed, then some of them are going to win a couple. Some of them are not. And you're going to get a 10 win team uh, almost by default. And, and I think we, we kind of saw that. I mean, we saw, you know, I think one of the biggest examples was number nine and three Nebraska playing what was actually just an above average Tennessee team and looked totally outmatched athletically, even though the game wasn't that close. Uh, I think we definitely saw it in the Pac-12, which had a pretty miserable bowl season. Um, 
And I, you know, I think we both think the SEC and the top of the SEC kind of look good. You know, it started with this narrative that the SEC was having a terrible bowl season, and then they won all but one game in the last couple of days. All the major bowls, the SEC did well, except with Georgia Tech uh, beating Kentucky. But again, uh, Georgia Tech had a better record than Kentucky, so that wasn't really surprising. But, you know, the other conference that I think falls into this category is the ACC. Um, much like the SEC, there were five or six teams in the ACC that were legitimately rather good. And what that meant is, you know, a team like Clemson could lose to Pitt, and it really was a bit of a one-off thing, and it was really impressive that Clemson only had one loss in that schedule. Uh, meanwhile, you know, Florida State comes in, beats a Michigan team that darn near won their conference, you know, was a 10-win Michigan team, only, quote-unquote, only a 9-win Florida State team, but, you know, Florida State had a darn tough schedule, you know, open the game, opening the year with Ole Miss. I know people can laugh all you want, but Ole Miss, the first four or five games of the season was a completely and utterly different team than they were once they got injury ridden uh, at the end of the year. And, you know, the, you know, they get beat down by Louisville, lose a close game to North Carolina. But what, what does that say? You know, they lost games against what were probably may well turn out to be, you know, ranked or nearly ranked teams in the ACC I don't think there was any shame in it. I think it was just the ACC had a lot of depth. It's tough to play good teams week in, week out. And, you know, when Florida State has a – you look back at that schedule and the fact that they played Louisville and then South Florida and North Carolina and Miami and Wake and Clemson and North Carolina State all in a row, that it's a tough, tough schedule. You know, South Florida ended up being a good team, uh, and they put 20 – you know, beat them 55-35, beat them by 20 points. And coming off that and the Louisville game, it's no surprise that they had a – you know, a rough day against North Carolina and a North Carolina team that darn near uh, beat Stanford, if not for a late uh, pick six in that ball game. So, uh, yeah, I think neither one of us is surprised. Again, we've been talking for some time that we felt like this bowl season was going to have more uh, upsets and shakeups contrary to public opinion than any we'd seen in a long time. I don't think it was because we had any really exact idea of where it was going to come from, but what we were looking at was sort of breaking down the data, noting the fact that none of the good teams in the conferences played each other. There were a lot of bad teams that played each other, but the none of the good teams played non-conference games against each other. Really, maybe Florida State and Ole Miss at the start of the year. That might well have been your best one. I'm not sure. Uh, and well, I guess South, Southern Cal, Alabama, and you know everybody wants to say that's a fluke, but at this point, I'm not really so sure. That's kind of an interesting point. But uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I think it did shake out that way. I think we found out that the the gap between the top of the Big Ten and the average bad teams in the Big Ten wasn't really all that great in retrospect. Uh, and the fact that Clemson, Florida State, Alabama, you know, having really good records within their conferences, LSU, uh, meant that those were actually really good teams. Uh, I got in a debate with some Pac-12 fans about the strength of Washington's schedule. Uh, and even some people in, in our um, our, either our highlight video or our preview show, the Washington game, people were talking about how much harder Washington's schedule was than Alabama's, and they picked a magic number of nine wins, and that there were nine, there were four nine-win teams or five nine-win teams in the Pac-12, and Alabama was the only nine-win team in the SEC. And it's funny because if they'd been listening to our show, they would already know. <laughs> where those non wins came from we've already done the work for y'all it's, it's out there just just watch the show but then I, I pulled up some numbers and what was kind of astonishing to me and, it, and i remember you pointed it out when you mentioned southern cal's closing schedule so with southern cal colorado um i guess utah and somebody else, Stanford, uh, these are all nine win teams who played at least six teams with a losing or beat at least six teams with a losing record. All but Colorado beat seven teams with a losing record. So, yes, you have nine wins, but in the case of Stanford, you close out your season with seven in a row, all seven wins in a row that Stanford got to close out the season were against teams who are getting beat by everybody else. That's not an accomplishment. That's not a big deal. If, if I, I think um, outside of Washington, the average win total for the teams that Southern Cal beat after Colorado, which is like the last, it was like six out of the last seven games, the average win total was like four wins so per team. So 
yeah, they look great. Yeah, it's a resurgence, but is it? I don't know because you're not beating anybody at this point. So the interesting thing about that is you mentioned Tennessee being a pretty average team, and yes, they were in the SEC East, but they actually beat six teams with a winning record uh, versus the others in the Pac-12 beating six teams with a losing record. So I thought that was pretty interesting, and I had a feeling that Tennessee was going to win that game because they were actually probably a little better than not only their record, but the tail end of their season indicated because of the injuries and things like that. So anyway, that's that's not even a rant. That's just, that's just a, a few facts for you. Um, so you touched on the Big Ten a little bit. Um, and before we get into Clemson and Ohio State, um, I, I wonder if – has the Big Ten – I think they're sitting at like two and – two and five or something not great right now has the big 10 sort of played out like you thought it would relative to all of our ranting we've done this season um or did they just get some bad matchups in the bowls and really overall are we reading too much into these bowl games that have specific tie-ins regional and such um or is it a kind of a this is what you've got in your conferences and your teams, and you just didn't see it because you didn't play outside of your conference for the last 10 weeks. Honestly, the Big Ten was probably worse than I anticipated. Uh, and it's kind of interesting. You know, we talked about seeding. In 2014, you know, the SEC kind of peaked with I think it was three teams in the top six. Uh, and then all the talk at the end of the season was how the SEC had such a miserable record in its big bowl games. But the other thing, you know, both of us have tried to note this year was, well, they had a bad record because they had a bunch of teams seated really high, you know, three teams in New Year's Six Bowls, uh, both Mississippi schools and Alabama, which also bumped everybody else that those teams had beaten into better bowls. And so they all had really, really tough matchups. And to some degree, that's probably hurting uh, you know, the Big Ten. Nebraska, you know, we say they had a better record than Tennessee, but Nebraska was not a ranked team. And, you know, Tennessee was 21 uh, going into that game. Nebraska probably would not normally or should not have been matched up against Tennessee. In fact, they would not have been. Uh, and, and if you drop that down a level, you know, who gets slotted into that game? I don't know. It, it may be Iowa, but, I mean, more than likely, you know, Wisconsin is, is a decent shot for who would have gotten in that game. Uh, had the Big Ten not had three teams uh, make the uh, New Year Six Bowls. So, you know, I don't know that Tennessee beats Wisconsin or, uh, you know, the, again, Michigan in the Orange Bowl, uh, you know, that's a very good team, and, and you give them credit for that. Uh, but uh, I don't know if, you know, would have Penn State have done better? I, I don't think that's necessarily the case, but, you know, they kind of almost get punished because they have this extra team uh, making a New Year's Six Bowl. I mean, again, Michigan, number six, it's the third team in the Big Ten in the major bowls behind Penn State and behind Ohio State. Um, you know, maybe somebody else could have been the uh, slaughter boy to have to go up against a Florida State team that's probably a lot better than their record. Uh, with all that said, you know, we didn't necessarily think the Big Ten was that good, so we're not necessarily surprised uh, at, at any of the results. I, I think it is just kind of, you know, what it is. We both felt like Michigan was probably the best team the Big Ten had, I think, or at least I know I did for much of the season. I, I didn't really buy in Ohio State. We discussed at length when Ohio State beat Michigan that Michigan, in a per-play sense, was significantly better in that game. They dominated the game uh in play to play for most of it um, had some terrible opportunity, missed opportunities, you know, some interceptions that led it directly to points, uh, let themselves get pushed to overtime and then gave up one, the one play they couldn't give up to lose in overtime. Uh, but, you know, outside of that, you know, there were a lot of signs that Ohio state really wasn't what they were cracked up to be. You know, as we said, Wisconsin is one of those teams that just didn't really play a whole lot of uh, good teams uh, when their converse late, the ones they did play Penn state, Michigan, uh, they lost and Penn State, you know, Penn State, Michigan, Ohio State lost all three of them. Uh, and, you know, they're going to be in a Cotton Bowl classic against Western Michigan tomorrow. And it wouldn't shock me if Wisconsin lost that game. I think they probably should win because I don't think Western Michigan's probably as good as their record. But, 
you know, Wisconsin, every time they've played a good team, a really good team, uh, it, it, outside of the initial uh, win over LSU, who, again, should have really beaten Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsin's lost. So, I don't know. It, it's not surprising to me, and uh, I think it sort of fell where it should have. I, I think people just made way too much out of the Big Ten having three or four teams that were a cut above everybody else, so they won the rest of their games in conference play. Um, and, you know, one of them happened to beat the other. So, you know, if Michigan and Ohio State play, obviously one of them has to win. So one of them will have a marquee win over the other. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean they're good. That just means you, the two teams played each other and that's kind of fate. And I, I will say, and I think you'll agree, like I, I thought Michigan and Ohio State were good football teams. I, I think they were a little bit a product of – a league that's incredibly top heavy. And like we've said all year bakes in a lot of wins. So the optics on their schedule and them as a team is probably a little better than it, than it, than it actually is. But I thought Michigan for the most part, you know, they look like they weren't ever going to win that game, but they did obviously compete, especially without peppers. And I know Florida state had some players out as well. So I think Michigan and Ohio State are both good teams. I think they ran into some bad matchups. I don't have an explanation for zero points, 31 nothing loss to Clemson for Ohio State. I think they're a better team than they showed there. But overall, I think it's fair to say, and I think based on what you just said, you agree, overall, outside of Michigan and Ohio State, which since we've already said they're pretty good, the Big Ten is exactly who we thought they were wire to wire this year. Right. And, and it's not a bad conference. And I don't want, you know, people are probably going to take that away from from everything I just said. What I'm getting at is we ranked, you know, three Big Ten teams in the top six, right? You know, we had Ohio State there. We had Michigan. We had Penn State in the top six. And we had four in the top eight with Wisconsin uh, still sitting there at eighth. I don't know that of the top eight teams in the country that half of them are Big Ten teams. That's all I'm saying. I think that the conference is very good. Uh, I think Michigan got by a lot of the year because they're a hard-nosed team. They're very physical, and they're extremely experienced, and, and I think that really showed. But I think the issue is as good as they are, they probably should not have been, you know, four of the top eight, three of the top six, that kind of otherworldly level that everybody was, I think, kind of clamoring to to jump to. Uh, it, it was a little bit too much. And, you know, like kind of like you said, you know, Michigan probably is a top tier team. Ohio State's also probably pretty good. But, yeah, they're they're all way too clustered uh, at the top of the rankings. And to distill your previous point, because it matters in all of this. This is why when the media hypes up a, a, a particular conference, and they've done it at the SEC before too, when the media hypes a particular conference and everybody gets on this bandwagon and everybody is overranked, just like you said before, um, it leads to them playing in a lot of bowl games that they lose, whereas if you drop everybody down one slot, and let's say, let's say Wisconsin is ranked 13th, Penn State's ranked ninth, you know, whatever, like drop everybody down a slot in terms of bowl placement. Then the Big Ten is probably flipping their record and looking a lot better than than they are right now. Is that, I mean, that's kind of what you were saying before. Yeah, it is. And I, you know, we keep talking about the Big Ten here, but the uh, relevant to the games that just got played, I think the bigger culprit that was a little bit of a surprise, but again, not really, because we did discuss this at some length, was the Pac-12. You know, the Big Ten was overrated merely because they were so highly ranked. But the conference that probably really, what really, really wasn't as good as their record, honestly, probably was the Pac-12. I don't think there's really any argument that Washington State, who lost to Minnesota, or, you know, Colorado, that just was uncompetitive with Oklahoma State, that those teams were the, you know, top 15 sort of teams they were ranked at at one point or another, right? I mean, okay. Colorado at 10, you know, looking back on it, how do you justify that? You know, what has Colorado in any way done to accomplish it? You know, the truth is, well, they really haven't done anything to accomplish that record. Uh, they ended this, they played, you know, their first ranked team was Michigan and they didn't play another, and they lost by 20 points to Michigan, didn't play another ranked team um, 
because USC wasn't ranked at the time, and the, even though they lost to USC, didn't play another ranked team until they played Washington State, the second to last game of the regular season. Uh, and, you know, Washington State, again, didn't prove to be that good. Utah didn't look that great. And then they get smoked by Washington in the final. And that very much is an issue, I think, where the bottom of the Pac-12 just wasn't very good. Teams were building wins with weak schedules. And, you know, it... You hate you hate the sort of cliche about not having played anybody because you hear it every year. But the reason it's such a cliche is that it's so frequently true in football, especially college football with a twelve game schedule. Um, and you know the Pac twelve, <laughs> the Pac twelve really did end up getting teams ranked very very highly by piling up wins over bad teams. And then you end up with you know a top ten Colorado playing a top ten Washington. Well, Washington blows out Colorado, so now you start jumping to the conclusion that Washington's really good, uh, and it's really hard for uh, people to sort of step back. And of course, the media, you know, mainstream media does not ever want to downplay any team or be really discrediting to step back and go, okay, maybe the issue isn't that it was so impressive for Washington to blow out Colorado. Maybe the issue is we should step back and look at this and go, maybe Colorado was severely uh, overranked. Um, and you know, yeah, I, I think, you know, the, the whole thing aside that we just said, it, it was the PAC 12 that was probably the biggest culprit, uh, of the scheduling issue overall this season and ended up with, again, a lot of bowl games like, you know, Colorado playing Colorado state where they got slotted a little bit too high, uh, and they got kind of exposed as a result. And for those who don't want to pull up the schedule, Colorado was Owen four against any team they played this year with a pulse and 0 and 4 with a lot of blowouts. But, you know, that was a big win for USC, that Colorado game. And it was a close game, I think. And there's a lot of signs pointing to USC not being as resurgent and, and not as great as everybody wants them to be. Um, but then again, Penn State, I'm not very high on either. So I don't think we're going to learn anything from that game. One game we did learn something from, though, was LSU and Louisville. And this is interesting because Louisville was one of those teams who 9-4, and 7-1 and one in the conference, and they're in the tougher division. So um, <clears throat> they, lost, they lost that game to Kentucky, so we kind of thought something was up. Houston, we can give a pass because obviously they've shown they can beat Oklahoma. They've got some talent there. But the Kentucky one was a little weird, but then Lamar Jackson comes out, and I don't know that it's completely on him that he laid an egg against LSU. A lot of it was his offensive line play, I think. Um, but it just seemed like an LSU team that's been one-dimensional all year that's still not got an answer at quarterback, the ability they had to move the ball pretty consistently, even on drives where they didn't score, they were moving the ball um uh, on this Louisville team who's been, you know, winning games all year, blew out Florida State. Everybody remembers that game. Tell me what we saw in this game, and is it uh, is it a situation where Louisville was just playing over their heads for most of the year, or was it just a really bad matchup for Louisville against a physical team that can run the ball and, and, and pose some weird matchups for them defensively? You know, we've – We've talked extensively about Louisville and how weird they are and how weird they are to evaluate. Uh, you know, we have an article on SECfans.com from very early in the season, I think it was week three, where we discussed at length how Louisville uh, in their, you know, massive scoring statistics were really a product of playing a really large numbers of possessions. Uh, Louisville is what some would call a high variance team, meaning they either score or they don't score very quickly. Uh, they'll either go three and out or they'll score a touchdown and they'll do it, you know, boom, 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 all o over and over and over. And in, in week three, they they were playing, uh, I think it was Syracuse, just coming out of the Syracuse game, 62 points. Everybody was super high on them. Look how many points they're scoring. And, you know, we pointed out that in a per possession sense, they had the same score that I think, you know, Alabama had putting up, I think, 24, 34 against Western Kentucky that week. It's just they played 16 possessions. So, yeah, you can, you know, put up 62 points. But in the first half where I think they had seven touchdowns, they were actually more likely to go three and out or turn the ball over than they were to score. 
It's just they had the ball so much that they still managed to score six times. They had 12 possessions in the first half of that ball game. That That's as many possessions as most teams, especially run teams like LSU, normally have. And why do I say all that? I say it because it inflated a lot of statistics uh, in terms of just pure total offense, total scoring, um, way beyond what was really there. And I think a lot of people got really unrealistic expectations for how good Louisville was offensively. They were... I mean, they were a good offensive team, but the yardage numbers that Lamar Jackson has this year, uh, to be frank, are not indicative of how well he plays in a per play sense. Uh, they're they're really just indicative of the style of football they play, the fact that they're taking eighty yard bombs over and over again. And when you do that, and you you do generate a lot of yardage very very quickly, uh, but it isn't necessarily very effective in a close football game. Now. In the LSU game, you know the there were a couple of big points here. And, and the first is LSU secondary is very very good. Uh, you know White, Jamal Adams, uh, these are superstar uh, secondary players. They have they have excellent linebackers and they have a very active front four and they have an elite pass rusher in Arden Key. You know this was a bad combination for Louisville, and it was a bad combination because it, you know Lamar Jackson couldn't really escape the pocket for most of this ball game. It was pretty clear. LSU said we're gonna we're gonna keep outside, keep containment in the middle. Um, we're gonna let Arden Key try to kind of run you down, uh, and then we're gonna keep Riley and Beckwith, you know, always with an eye on you. And they're athletic and big enough that they're gonna bring you down if you try to get outside. So we're gonna make you throw the football downfield, give you some kind of one-on-one matchups. And what we've seen from all year from Louisville is Lamar Jackson. He does have an excellent deep ball if he has time to throw it. Uh, but in short to intermediate range passing, especially if he has to sit in the pocket, set his feet, he's a below average passer. Um, he, he's just honestly just not very good in that situation. So, uh, yeah, LSU was able to put Louisville in an awkward position. Uh, Louisville, again, still runs that style of offense that can go three and out very, very quickly. Um, they certainly did that in this game. And, you know, I, again, I mean, when you do that and you go, you know, three and out over and over again against a team that is going to run the ball a lot, uh, then you're going to get your defense worn down. Uh, and, you know, LSU had a lot of really ineffective drives and they won 29 to nine. But, you know, 16, six at the end of the first half was something of a close ball game. But, you know, let's if you look back at it, LSU had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight possessions in the first half. Um that's as many possessions as about as many as LSU has in a lot of ball games. And they only had 16 points off those eight possessions. So LSU really wasn't scoring a whole lot. The problem is, um, you know, Louisville had a series there of f- six drives in a row where they went three and out in the first half. Uh, and as I s- said again, and to t- sort of tell it all together, as much as you want to say, well, LSU's defense was just stifling, even in the Syracuse game where they put 62 points up, they were more likely to go three and out or turn it over than score. It's just normally they got the ball enough because really because their defense could shut you down very quickly that they would eventually start scoring points. They would get get up on you. You'd get out of your game plan and you couldn't meet them stride for stride once everybody started getting exhausted. LSU, with their sort of pound-on-ground style of football, um, they were able to shorten the game quite a bit so LSU couldn't extend the possessions the way they like to, or Louisville couldn't extend the possessions. And, you know, Louisville started getting behind a little bit. I mean, there's no doubt that Louisville's offense was, you know, not just anemic, but but kind of pretty terrible, right? I mean, Jackson had 5.7 yards per attempt, which is just okay, but certainly not great. Uh, But they were killed to 1.9 yards per carry, um, an interesting point there, by the way, and this is something that we've harped on. Uh, it's beyond a soapbox at this point. <laughs> the The fact that teams are refusing to let their running backs actually run the ball. You know, Brandon Radcliffe for Louisville actually averaged 4.3 yards per carry. It's not bad. You know, that's a decent average. And it, it was Especially a lot better. Especially against LSU. Than, right. And that's better than about anything else they were doing. They only got six carries for Radcliffe. Lamar Jackson had 26 carries. He almost had as many carries as he had pass attempts. Um, and, you know, total 60, what, what are we at now? 53 passes and rushes by Jackson and only nine carries by anyone else in the ball game. So they basically diminished the 
real run threat to the point of non-existence. Put everything in Lamar Jackson's hands. And if you do that, and you're playing a defense that is quite good, which LSU is, then LSU is going to say, okay, well, we're going to key everything in our front seven to Lamar Jackson. We're going to make sure Lamar Jackson does not run the ball and beat us. And so we're going to keep him in the pocket and force him to throw. And we're going to kind of ignore everything else. And if you refuse to hand the ball off to anybody else, that game plan is going to work and it's going to work pretty well. And once you go three and out again, like six times in a row, eventually your defense is going to start getting tired. And I think the most underrated point with Louisville is their run defense was actually elite this year. Uh, eventually they did start getting tired. And at the end of the game, Darius guys started generating a lot of yardage. I mean, guys only averaged ended up with 5.3 yards per carry with a uh, 70 yarder with a 70 yarder. Yeah. He only had 38, 138 yards. So if you do the math, at 68 yard uh, average, you know, 68 total yards on 25 carries, that's only 2.72 yards per carry outside of the 70 yarder. So it's not like LSU was running the ball well over the course of the game. They just warmed down late because Louisville and their high powered big play offense, when it didn't generate big plays like it has all year, um, it it just completely stalled, and that's how LSU won the ball game. You know what I thought was kind of interesting, though, for a team like Louisville who has shown throughout the year that they can score points in buckets, and like we saw in, in the weight game, they can score points. They can go stall, stall, stall for almost the whole game and then pour it on just at clicks because we know how streaky they are. They approached this game once they went down seven to three, like they were down twenty eight to three. Like the whole game, they they completely abandoned tempo because they're worried about giving LSU the ball back. LSU wasn't doing that much. To your point, I mean, they were they were driving the ball a little bit, but they weren't putting points on the board. So it was really interesting to me to see. It's almost like they panicked early in the second quarter. Um, and I wonder if that's a limitation. Maybe this is me overthinking it, uh, but I'd love for you to weigh in on it. I feel like there's a limitation with some of these teams that are that are either either air raid teams or spread teams that that can, for most of their schedule, score at will. It's almost like they panic too soon when early on they're not scoring very much. Is that a thing or am I overthinking that too much? Tell me what you think. I think it depends on the team, but it certainly can be. I mean, it's mental. Uh, some of the best teams, I think Oregon was an example. Oregon was willing to sort of chip away and chip away and chip away until they finally started putting up big points in their heyday when, with Chip Kelly. They would do that to a lot of people. It would be a close game the second or third quarter, uh, and then all of a sudden they'd score a couple times and they'd go off. And, and it was because they had confidence in their coaches, I think, and they'd been through enough battles that they knew that eventually the points would come. But – you, sometimes you get these young teams with certain types of players, and I think they do panic, especially if you have sort of cocky superstar quarterbacks like Lamar Jackson, um, you know, who's been, you know, win the Heisman Trophy, thinks he's all world, and, and now he's struggling. And you start to question yourself, and you start to press, and, and everything just kind of goes to crap. And, you know, we've said this for a long time, though, with Petrino offenses. There's a lot of deep passing routes. It's the same problem Texas A&M has, really. Lots of deep passing routes in that tree. They don't have a lot of short, easy completions. And this year, in particular, Jackson is remarkably bad at completing those. I mean, his, I think he's something like 2 of 11 on the year on swing passes to running backs. And just crazy statistics like that. But if you have that style of offense where you want to run deep plays, if you've got five seconds to throw the ball, and you're running double moves, guys are going to be open. I mean, you can't you can't really cover a double move and a lot of deep deep crossing routes that long uh, with any consistency. And so you kind of get in a rhythm with that, and you expect guys to be open. And then you play a team like LSU, and LSU's defense was honestly as good as their defense was being. He had some time to throw. The problem was their offense doesn't really have any options that are open at three seconds or four seconds. And Lamar Jackson isn't in any way used to having to throw it at three or four seconds. So that clock in your head starts speeding up. And when the clock in your head starts speeding up, you just start to panic and you bail on the pocket because you feel like you don't have time. And you say, you, you start to think to yourself, I cannot run the offense the way I need to run it. 
because that won't work. So I have to do something different. You don't really think about whether different is good or bad. In a lot of cases, it is bad. And so you do something different when really you just need to have patience and say, I need to sit here and keep trying to run these plays. And eventually, I'll get the five seconds I need to throw and we'll hit a bomb and we'll put some points on the board. Uh, and, and instead, you you know flee the pocket or you try to make a throw that you're not comfortable making. Um, and, and, you know, in the end of the day, when you do that, you're going to, you're going to go three and out just as fast, only now you're not going to put up any points. So, yeah, I, I think there's justification in what you say, but I, I think it definitely varies team to team. And it, that's just really a player psychology question. And a lot of that probably has to do with coaching. So you, you mentioned Darius Geis and, and I was going to bring that up. It's the fact that he had a 70 yarder and still only averaged 5.3 yards of carry talking about this team, a little bit, and, and guys, hang with us a little bit. We're going to get into some of this other these other games and this other stuff. Um, but again, this is unscripted, and I I, I, I want to talk about some of this stuff because this is the last thing you see. These bowl games, are the last thing you see before going into the next year, and our discussion in the spring is going to be what are we going to see? What are these teams going to do? Well. LSU's got a new coaching staff coming in uh, next season a little bit, especially on the offensive side of the ball with Matt Canada. Um, Geis, I think, is a good running back. We've said all year that he's a good running back. I don't know that Geis is a Leonard Fournette-type running back, especially a healthy Leonard Fournette-type running back, which wasn't very often, Um, which leads me to wonder – where does LSU's offense go with Matt Canada in 2017? And there was a good question at the end of the game. The the broadcasters were talking about how is the quarterback race back to square one? Like, like is there any sort of memory on Etling, the fact that he was a starter all year? Does he get all the reps in spring practice? Is he assumed QB1 coming in? And I don't know that he is because I'm still not that impressed with him. I noticed there were a lot of throws he made in this game against Louisville where you had Chark or Dupree wide open on maybe a 10, 15-yard pass. He'd hit the pass, but the ball took so long to get there that the the yards after, after catch were half of what they could have been. And... Uh, you know, I know that's 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 like one small thing, but he doesn't have a lot of arm talent, in my opinion. Um, and, and Geis is not uh, a Leonard Fournette, or he, I don't think he's he is yet shown that he's as good as a lot of the backs that they have they've had in the past. So, in your opinion, talk about the challenges or maybe the opportunities that Canada has coming into the 2017 season. Is it a clean slate? Is are we looking at maybe Harris coming back around or them inserting a freshman or do you see it being a little bit of a continuation of what they've had this year simply because of personnel and maybe limitations therein? I don't know. Uh, I, you know, I, I think to some degree they're going to want to go back to square one and reevaluate the quarterback situation. Um, the problem with that is I don't know that they have any good options, frankly. I mean, I, I don't know where they're going to come from. It seems pretty clear at this point that for w- whatever players they have, uh, Brennan Harris and Danny Etling are, are the two best choices they have. And like you, I thought Etling all year was really limited as a passer. I think it was almost... I won't call it a mistake, but I think it was misguided when people felt like Etling, you know, was clearly the man and took over. There were a lot of signs statistically we talked about uh, early in the season that Etling was no better as a passer uh, than Brandon Harris. You could really see a lot of those physical limitations in play. Now, I think he is a better passer, but it's one of those things where Brandon Harris's athleticism gives him an edge, uh, even though he doesn't throw the ball as well and makes him similarly effective. Uh, but you know, Nathan Peterman at Pitt and everybody's going to talk about Matt Canada and his pit offense. I mean, Peter Peterman at Pitt this year was just darn effective in every game. I mean, he was a good quarterback. He set his feet. He could throw down field, had a solid arm, had good accuracy. You know, Matt Canada isn't going to magically snap his fingers and make either one of these guys 
you know, suddenly an all-world quarterback overnight. Danny Etling is almost at a ceiling, I think. I mean, he's just not very talented. Uh, the arm strength thing, there's no correctable issue there. He just doesn't have a lot of velocity in his throws because he doesn't have great arm talent. Um, Brandon Harris probably has more potential, but I, I'm not really sure he's ever going to completely get the offense. But it wouldn't shock me to see them go back to Brandon Harris if they're smart enough to design the offense and call plays such that Brandon Harris is put in situations where he can use his talent without making stupid decisions. Um, but, you know, that, that may be a lot to ask. I mean, I, I think the truth with a lot of stuff offensively and defensively is it is often more about the Jimmys and Joes than the X's and O's. Um, I, and, you know, there are certainly some exceptions to this, but I think it's often very true at quarterback. It's funny to me, and we've both talked about this a lot, that LSU's resurgence middle and late in the year were came at running almost exactly the same offense that they ran under Les Miles. I mean, there was very little change. Would you yeah, agree with that? Yeah, I would, and, and I was arguing with an LSU fan. I, there's a common theme in all the things that I talk about <laughs> in my time in between us filming this show. Basically, I just argue with other college football fans. Um, I was arguing with an LSU fan about how Auburn deserved to be – in the Sugar Bowl against Oklahoma, and they talked about how Auburn was a beneficiary of playing a soft schedule after the LSU game, and it made them look better, the optics and, and all that. And I pulled up the numbers because that's what I do. I'm not going to make an, an argument or a debate without having some numbers to support it. LSU this year, after the Auburn game, faced in their wins, on average, the 94th ranked rushing defense. For a team that doesn't have a quarterback, that has a couple of really good running backs and likes to rack up three, 400 rushing yards a game, I'd say that's just what the doctor ordered to make you look maybe better than you are is facing a bunch of soft run defenses. No, I, I, I'd agree. And, and you know, I, I think Danny Etling as the quarterback and his success had way more to do with that than it did with Danny Etling. Uh, and I think it's probably better for them to have Etling in the sense that Etling seemed to at least kind of have comfort, a comfort level of running the offense, calling the correct plays. But, I mean, there's no doubt that in the Alabama game, Etling was completely and utterly incapable of doing anything positive. I mean, he couldn't hit the broadside of a barn. He could not throw a hitch. Uh, and you know, the Louisville game here, I mean, he had a fair number of yards, but Louisville was pretty well anchored down on the run game and pretty well daring Etling to throw. And he was still just barely over a 50% passer. So I don't know what they're going to do. Uh, I think Canada is going to try to make some improvements and what he's really going to do is try to invent ways to scheme guys to be open in the past game, because I don't think anybody's going to be able to really fix the issue that they don't have a quarterback that can accurately deliver the football. All they can do is find a way to generate a pass play when the quarterback isn't producing one himself. Um, and so, yeah, I don't really expect, honestly, a lot to change next year. And I hate to say this, but I think it could be a little bit of a disappointment for a lot of people, given the fact that the uh, defense is probably going to lose a fair amount of talent, I'm going to guess, depending on NFL departures. So that's, I don't know, it, it just kind of is what it is. And they're going to have to, Orgeron's going to have to record him, recruit him a quarterback. You know, we saw Brennan today. I, I watched the uh, high school All-Star game. And he looked like a talent, but I, I, I hate to say this, but Brennan isn't isn't where I would like a quarterback to be if you want him to start as a true freshman. It's going to take a little bit of time for him to adjust to the speed of the game. So he's, I don't think, going to be an immediate option. And Narcisse, my understanding is that he's probably even more of a raw prospect. Uh, and the worst thing, you, last thing you want to do is what the, exactly what they did with Brandon Harris. Take a true freshman quarterback that was a developmental project. Again, you know, Alabama and LSU had a big battle for him. And the opinion for everyone in the recruiting circles was, you know, he's a high level four star because as a red shirt junior, he'll probably be pretty good. And LSU started him as a true freshman. And I think he's almost irrevocably broken uh, from the bad habits he's created, you know, not setting his feet, not getting the clock in his head correctly, et cetera. Um, I, you know, kind of fear we may be seeing the same thing happening to Jacob Eason at Georgia, but yeah, I mean, LSU is going to be a few years before that quarterback situation is fixed. And if you want to give one justification for letting go of Les Miles 
I can buy that one. I mean, the the quarterback situation is set them back for a few years, um, and it's you know other outside of a uh, graduate transfer, which maybe they look at again. Uh, I'm not really sure how they immediately fix that problem. So